Formulation of Transmission Line Analysis. In this video, we're ultimately after two simple matrix equations that will let us model, simulate, calculate transmission lines using the finite difference method. So first we'll derive the governing equations and talk about those and then work on the finite difference approximations and putting that into matrix form. The actual solution and analysis will come in a following video. Here we're just deriving these matrix equations. Derivation of governing equations. We are making the electrostatics approximation, which we now understand reduces Maxwell's equations down to a reduced set of equations. And we pull off the three equations that are describing the electric fields. So we have a divergence equation, we have our constitutive relation. And this third one isn't even really one of Maxwell's equations. It turns out we can describe our vector electric field in terms of a scalar quantity called the electric potential. And these are related through the negative gradient as we've already talked about. So that's where we're starting. So what we'll do is expand these into Cartesian coordinates and write them in sort of a matrix form. Uh, that will make it easier when we make our finite difference approximation. So our divergence equation is the derivative of dx with respect to x plus the derivative of dy with respect to y and the derivative of dz with respect to z. And so we're doing a row column multiplication. And that gives us the dot product between our del vector and the d vector. We have our constitutive relation, which is really a three by three tensor multiplying our electric field. One thing we've done is set these off diagonal components all to zero. That's not absolutely necessary to do, but it will complicate the analysis. And, and so instead, we'll just restrict ourselves to what we we'll call diagonally anisotropic materials. So that lets us incorporate some anisotropy, but not all. And as I mentioned, it is certainly possible to have permittivity in these off diagonal positions, but it complicates the analysis, so we'll stick with this. And then the electric field being related to the electric potential. So we have our electric field in a column vector. We have our derivatives in a column vector multiplying this electric potential. And then of course the negative sign, which enforces the sign convention where our electric fields point from high voltage to low voltage. So as an example of a transmission line, I've drawn a microstrip transmission line here at the lower right. So we have a big, huge ground plane underneath. That's a chunk of metal connected to ground. We have some kind of plastic dielectric substrate above the ground, and we have our signal trace. And so this would be called a microstrip transmission line. And we can expect the electric fields and even our electric potential to really only be significant in the vicinity of that line and essentially decay to zero pretty quickly. So there's some kind of window in the cross section of the waveguide that will encompass 99.9% .9 of all the information we need. And that's what we'll build on our grid when it comes time to simulate. We don't have to build in this whole big transmission line. Now notice that this transmission line in the Z direction, nothing is changing, right? In the X direction, we have our line that stops and starts. In the y direction, we have the line and substrate to ground plane. So things are changing in the x and y direction, but in this z direction, absolutely nothing changes. And so if nothing is changing in the z direction, it makes sense then that we could set our z derivatives equal to zero. And that's what we'll do, and that helps us simplify the math. So we had our divergence equation, and now we know that the z derivative is zero. So that drops out of this equation, and that we also lets us set the z component of d equal to zero. So our analysis will only have a dx and y component. There will be no z component to, to d. We have our constitutive relation. Since the the z component of d is zero. That makes the z component of e equal to zero. And in fact, the fields don't even feel epsilon zz. Even though that may not be or may be there, 
since we only have X and Y components of the electric field, it's only the epsilon XX and epsilon YY tensor elements that are even felt by the electric field. And the electric field being related to the electric potential, there is no Z component. Also our Z derivative is crossed off. So we really just have X and Y components of E being related to that electric potential. So because everything's uniform in the z direction and we're simulating everything in the cross section, our three equations in not quite a matrix form, but yeah, I guess sort of a matrix form, uh, we have it this way now for two dimensions. So let's move on. And one last note here, since the z component of the electric field is zero, the electric field only exists in the transverse plane. And in electromagnetics, we would call this a transverse electromagnetic mode. Now, some transmission lines don't support purely TEM modes. We can still simulate them this way. We will be calculating as if it is a TEM mode, but even the ones that don't support a pure TEM mode, very often the mode in those transmission lines is very, very close to TEM and can still be very accurately analyzed as a TEM mode. So this is not something we need to be real paranoid about. So here's our final governing equations in sort of our matrix form and then our you know expanded, not in matrix form, just the individual equations. So a little bit simpler and we're in two dimensions now instead of three. Finite difference approximation of the governing equations. So we need to figure out whether or not we need to stagger our derivatives across the grid. Let's go ahead and look first at the constitutive relations. Remember, we need every term in our finite difference equation to exist at the same point in time and space. We don't have time here, so we're only concerned about space. And we would like our finite differences to be very tight and only span one grid cell. Well, there are no finite differences here. And so we can just define all of these terms to exist at the same point. So that's the X component. We have the same conclusion for the Y component. So the conclusion here is as far as the constitutive relations are concerned, no staggering is needed. Now let's think about the equation relating the electric field and the electric potential. So first we look at the X component. The X component of the electric field is equal to negative partial derivative of V with respect to X. So when we approximate this with finite differences that we only want to span one grid cell, we'll have a V at one cell minus V at another divided by delta X. Interpreting this as a central finite difference, we immediately see that our electric field quantities need to be at the midpoint between our V's. So we will define this V and E to be within the same cell. So our finite difference will be V from the next cell minus V from the same cell divided by the spacing between them, which is delta X. So the way the electric field is weighted is uh, related to the electric potential. This suggests we need a staggered grid. Let's look at the y component. Same equation. We're just now taking a derivative in the y direction. We only want to span one cell in the y direction. So we have the difference between two v's and adjacent cells vertically. And interpreting that as a central finite differences, as a central finite difference, that means the electric field should exist at the midpoint. So again, we need to stagger in both x and y directions, e and v. But from the last slide, we need to place the D's and the epsilons exactly where the E's exist. So D, epsilon, and E will all reside at the same point. The V's are staggered around the E's. So a two-dimensional grid, just four by four, now a realistic grid would be more like 100 by 100, but just drawing four by four, this is how it will work. We're going to place the electric potential at the origin of each cell. So this electric potential while at the corner of our first cell really belongs to the second one. So I hope that's not confusing, but that's just a consequence of defining this at the origin. The X component of the electric field will be offset along the X axis by a half cell. 
and the Y component of the electric field will be offset along the Y axis by a half cell. So each cell contains one EX, one EY, and one V. And so this is a full four by four array. This is showing the true positions on the grid, but remember how yeah, it might get a little confusing. Which cell does this field belong to? Well, we kind of know it belongs to the second one, but it's not so clear. Here's a little bit more crude way that we could draw that. It doesn't accurately portray the actual positions of these within the cell, but it's easy to see, oh, okay, here, this electric potential belongs to this cell, EX, this EY, it belongs to this cell. So in the next video and later on, we'll be drawing it this way, and that will help us. But make no mistake about it, this is the actual grid and where everything actually exists on the grid. So let's jump to the matrix form, not the matrix form we had before. This is the matrix form where we approximate everything with finite differences and put that huge set of equations into matrix form. So we start with our governing equations. We then do our finite difference approximation. So we approximate our partial derivative of D with respect to X, partial derivative of DY with respect to Y, our constitutive relations, and then our electric field being related to the electric potential approximating with finite differences and taking into account the staggering of the grid. Now we can go one at a time. We could look at this equation and say, we need to write this once for every cell in the grid. That huge set of equations can be put into a matrix equation. And we can say the same thing about each one of these equations. Each one is going to be written once for every cell in the grid. So we have one, two, three, four, five equations that each will be cast into a matrix equation. Now here we are, we have five matrix equations. And these truly are matrices. This is our derivative matrices we've been talking to. And it's on a staggered grid, so we'll have different derivatives, whether we're taking derivatives of electric field quantities or electric potential quantities. Now notice we're taking a derivative of a D field, but I still have the E superscript here. And the E superscript is really just any electric field since DX and EX, DY and EY, they all exist at the same point. So they have the same derivative matrices. So I'll just stick with the E superscripts here. So we have our derivative matrices. We have our column vectors. This one containing the X component of the D field. This one containing the Y component. And this bold zero is a column vector of zeros. So dx, dy, ex, and ey, those are all column vectors. E naught, that's a constant or free space permittivity. Now epsilon xx and epsilon yy, these are doing point by point multiplications onto these two column vectors. So those are diagonal matrices. And down here we have our derivative matrices operating on V. So we have the V superscript and V is a column vector containing the electric potential all throughout the grid. All right, so now we have five matrix equations. Back to this form when I kind of stumbled on whether this is matrix form or not. It's not really because all of these things are not matrices, but it's sort of a matrix form. We can write our previous actual matrix equations in block matrix form. And now you can see the parallel between these sort of analytical matrix equations and these fully numerical matrix equations. And this gets a little bit easier to think about and track. So we're down now to three block matrix equations. Now remember what we did before, we had our electrostatic equations and we did a bunch of substitutions to get one differential equation in terms of the electric potential. We're going to do that again. But we've done this a little bit differently. We've jumped to matrix form very early in the process, and now we'll start substituting equations into each other. So here's our divergence equation, the del dot D equals zero. We also have our constitutive relation, D equals epsilon times E. Well, we have this expression now for our D fields. So we can take this expression and replace the D fields with that expression. And we end up here. We can divide this both sides by this constant epsilon naught, right? That can come to the outside of the derivatives and that just disappears. And when that's done, we end up here. 
And that's actually the, the final form for this slide. So we have everything now in terms of just the electric field E. One more step before we're at the final, final uh, matrix equation. So this is where we were from the last slide. We have a single matrix equation in terms of the electric field. But remember, the electric field is the negative gradient of the electric potential. So we can replace the electric field in this equation with this expression for in terms of the electric potential. So we throw that in. We end up there. We can get rid of the negative sign, right? Because that's a constant. We can bring it to the outside, multiply both sides by negative one, and the negative sign just disappears. And we end up here. And that is the absolute final form. That is the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation in matrix form. This is the one that we will solve to calculate the electric potential. So here's our final matrix equations. In prior videos, we derived this inhomogeneous Laplace's equation. That's the analytical equation. We just derived the matrix form of that. But what's neat is with staggered derivatives, we can just leave it in this form. We don't have to do any kind of product rule or expand it any further. We just enter it like that and let MATLAB do all the thinking for us. We also needed the homogeneous Laplace's equation. And that really is the same as this equation. It's just that our permittivity, our relative permittivity is all ones. This becomes the identity matrix and it really just drops out. So here is the matrix form of the homogeneous Laplace's equation. So we'll solve this first one to get distributed capacitance and we'll solve the second one to get the distributed inductance. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.